Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing another episode of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlights. I know it's been a while since I've done one of these but I've got up to like part 64 right now so we've got like 11 parts almost to go through so that's a month of lots and lots of good Planet Zoo content so how can you guys not be happy with that but today we're going to be going through a few remakes along with some really cool new animals that have been made so we're going to be starting off with a couple remakes uh, these are two subspecies of the black and white rough lemur so these both were made by leaf we've got the white belted lemur and the uh hills black and white rough lemur so two different subspecies of the same thing oh they're going a bit fast anyway we'll have a look here so this one is the hills i believe yeah the hills I think the best way to differentiate the hills uh, from the white belted uh, rough lima is you can see this one almost looks like it's got a white sweater on or like a white top and like a white back while the white belt as you can see here this one's a juvenile you say an adult here but you can see that they've got the um, kind of white belt going through the middle of their back that's where they get the name the white belted it's quite similar so this was kind of just updated with the uh, black and white red lima that came with that update a little while ago. And I think they look a little bit better now. I'm a really big fan of that. So these guys are an endangered species of lima. Critically endangered, actually. They're one of the two species of uh, rough lima, along with the uh, red rough lima. And they are only found on the islands of Madagascar. We'll have a look at one of the babies we are talking about. Them. Really, really cute. So uh, these guys, these three subspecies are kind of reproductively isolated with the uh, white belted white rough lemur is the one that's found furthest north and the southern black and white rough lemur is found south. So that's the um, nominate subs, uh, I believe that's the uh, nominate subspecies, I believe. Uh, editorum is the hills, so I believe that's found most southern. Uh, really, really cute little guy there, little baby. Let's uh, move over here. So yeah, these guys are uh, critically endangered, so they're really, really impacted by lots of deforestation and things like that that's happening in Madagascar, especially and trafficking as well. That's a big issue in Madagascar. And they are the largest extent members of their family of Lemuridae. And they can range from 100 to 120 centimeters long, or 3 foot 3 to 3 feet 9 inches uh, feet long, and weigh between 3.1 and 4.1 kilograms, or 6.8 uh, to 9 pounds. As you can see, they're quite adept in the trees. They're arboreal, so they spend most of their day in the um, high canopies of trees, feeding on fruits and things like that. And they're also diurnal, so that means they really only come out in the daytime. And they live most of the time, as I mentioned, they live in the high canopy. They live in the rainforest across the um, uh, eastern side of Madagascar, uh, which sadly their habitat is getting mostly destroyed by logging which kind of sucks. And um, quadrupedal locomotion, as you see here, is preferred in the trees, uh, but they'll also suspend themselves using their tails uh, to eat fruits and things. That's what they're most commonly found. Although they will also eat leaves, uh, seeds, and nectar, uh, and flowers as well. They have quite, uh, they're quite, they're foliivores. That means they primarily eat fruit and soft greens. And like other lemurs, they have quite a complex social system. So they've been known for their loud calls, as you can hear. And they actually um, are unusual is that they exhibit several reprodu uh, reproductive traits that are typically found in lemurs that are much smaller and nocturnal. So they're quite different in that way. Such as a uh, short gestation period, uh, large litters and rapid maturation. That means they grow up pretty fast. And in captivity, they can live quite long. They can live about 36 years. And they are quite cool. As you can see, this one's the white belted with that white belt going on there. Really, really awesome model here. I love that leaf updated these two lemurs. And we've got to look over them again. And it's cool seeing a direct comparison of the two. I could put, you could have put the end game one here, the uh, official black and white rough lemur to compare the different subspecies. But that's fine as it is. And we've got another subspecies going on. Uh, we covered the redneck wallaby, but now we have got the uh, burnett's wallaby, as you can see here. Really cute little guys. And one thing that's also really cool is that they've managed to change the size of the juveniles using um, ANGCE, I believe that's his name. So you're able to fix some of the files and things like that and really makes it much better. So this is the burnett's wallaby, or Notomacropus um, rufosensis. Uh, which is a medium-sized macropod, so that's a group of uh, marsupials that are uh, 
can't include wallabies, kangaroos, and like the ones that hop like that. And they're most like, uh, mostly found around the more temperate and fertile areas of Eastern Australia. That includes Tasmania as well. Uh, but they've been introduced into a bunch of other countries such as New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Ireland, the Isle of Man, France, and Germany. So these guys can get quite big and they're usually distinguished by their black nose and paws with this red stripe on them. That kind of gives them the name the red uh, necked wallaby. They can get to about uh, 13 to 18 kilograms or 30 to 41 pounds and attain a head to body length of about 90 centimeters. Though g males are generally bigger than the females. And um, as I mentioned, they kind of live across uh, eastern Australia. They live in more temperate parts along with Tasmania. So they live in quite temperate areas. And they're mainly solitary, but they will gather uh, together when there's an abundance of food or water or shelter. And usually when there's, they do uh, group together, they have a social hierarchy where they kind of like demonstrate themselves and try and manage conflict and things like that. And they're actually mostly nocturnal. So they spend most of the daytime uh, resting, but obviously they do most of their foraging and hanging out at night. Uh, in terms of their female estrus, it only really lasts only 33 days. And during courtship, the female will first lick the male's neck and the male will rub his cheek against the female. Then they have a little fight and then they will copulate and the female will bear the offspring and only has, uh, not pregnant for very long, but the, um, they stay in the pouch for about 280 days. Uh, whether the, uh, females and the offspring stay together for only a month. And the female males stray from its own range of their mothers in life, where the males leave at the age of two. And uh, they actually uh, also show allopatric, uh, alloparental care, which means that one individual may adopt a child of another. Uh, so they're quite, um, you could say, generous with their uh, giving uh, of parental uh, care. And this is actually behavior that's common seen in uh, many other animals, such as wolves, elephants, humans, and uh, fatted minnows. In terms of their diet, they primarily feed on grasses, roots, and things like that. Let's look at these cute little babies now. Look how small they are. Look at a little. Very, very cute. So, as I mentioned, there's kind of like three subspecies. We covered the redneck wallaby. That's uh, uh, Notromactus ruf uh, rufothensis uh, baconensis. But this one's the kind of nominate subspecies, or the subspecies that was first described. And it's kind of the typical uh, variation of the species. It's... Um, Nota macropus uh, rugolfensis rugolfensis, so that's the Burnett's wallaby, which is kind of a smaller island subspecies um, that's found in Tasmania, while the kind of other subspecies like the redneck wallaby is found more on the mainland. And um, yeah, really, really cool to show off the variation of these guys, and it's cool to see the babies compared to the adults. Really cool to see these guys come out. Uh, these guys were made by Leaf as well. Leaf did a wonderful job with these uh, wallabies. I cannot blame him. So he's made of the first three mods. But next we've got a uh, couple crocodilians. Uh, not a couple crocodilians. We've got one crocodilian and one uh, terrapin or uh, tortoise, you could say. One of the chelidonians, you could say. Uh, but now we've got the broad uh, snouted caiman done by Leaf and Mega Rex Gaming, who's uh, very famous kind of for doing all these crocodilians. And I think it has come out rather nicely. So the broad snouted caiman, or caiman latronesis, is a crocodilian uh, that is uh, related to alligators. It's in the family Alligatoridae, that is found in Central South America, which includes uh, southeastern Brazil, northern Argentina, like Uruguay, a lot of those areas, uh, Paraguay and uh, Bolivia, where they're mainly found in these freshwater marshes, swamps and mangroves, in kind of like very um, shallow water. Or slow moving water, you should say. Uh, in the wild, they can actually get pretty big. They normally grow between two and two and a half meters, or seven feet, uh, six foot seven to eight and two inches long. But a few old males have got up to about 11 feet long, or about 3.5 meters. Captive adults that have been weighed are generally between 29 and 62 kilograms, or 64 and 137 pounds. And most, as you see, tend to be in this light olive green color. And a few individuals tend to have spots on their faces as well. And their snout, as you can see, is well adapted to rip through the dense vegetation of the marshes. And due to this, they can uh, often swallow some vegetation as well. So they technically eat a little bit of plants as well. Very, very interesting. So they're not too different from other um, crocodilians in terms of their diets and behavior. 
though these guys uh, tend to feed on turtles and snails and other smaller vertebrates as well uh, and as they get bigger they will increase on their prey that they'll eat uh, all young caiman tend to eat like small insects and things but as they grow they will take birds fish and reptiles uh, cactus specimens have also been uh, found eating free fruit and um, it's also suggests that these guys may be like an obligate um, omnivores and may eat lots of different fruits and may actually play a pretty important role in uh, seed dispersal so this just shows like the you can hear the dichotomy between like herbivore and carnivore but it's often way more muddy than that so it is uh, it's pretty cool I think so we'll have a look at the babies here where's the babies there's a cute little baby here so in terms of uh, reproduction the female will lay about 18 to 50 eggs uh, at a time while where they can they have been found to have 129 eggs in a single nest uh, so that's a lot of babies and they're typically laid in two layers with a slight temperature difference because these guys uh, this uh, temperature sex determination so that means uh, higher temperatures or lower temperatures will tend to develop into males or females so eggs with warmer temperatures will tend to uh, turn into males and cooler temperatures will turn into females as you can see here really really cute little guys here and um, it's very important to uh, have those right temperatures so you have the right um, sex ratios in the population really really cute little uh, animals though and like other crocodilians they're quite protective parents the mother will stay by the nest and help the babies and things like that very very good parents crocodilians are which is really really cool and in terms of the conservation they are least concerned and they have quite a big range as i mentioned they live through uh, a lot of like the southern parts of brazil uruguay paraguay not quite in the amazon but kind of a little bit, a little bit below there and the really really cool animals uh hunting for the species kind of began in the 1940s where the skin was used uh, kind of like other crocodilians for like purses and things though most countries have kind of made that illegal and this was the largest threat to their um, population and the caimans this has helped them come back from that but their new threat is kind of very very bad uh, habitat destruction because of obviously the clearing of the amazon and um, other forests that they live in that's been a big issue for these guys uh, also deforestation and pollution runoff has been a big thing the pollutants in the water can affect the hormones and uh, poison some of the animals as well but they are generally considered uh, across the board least concerned so there's lots of animals and they're recovered uh, similar to the situation of the american alligator they just recover really quickly so these guys have done a really good job at recovering and are quite common and i think they're really cool they're kind of an unappreciated caiman but I think they're really really cool so now we're going to move on to the next animal this is done by leaf as well we have got an alligator but not an alligator alligator we've got the alligator snapping tortoise uh, or turtle you could say so this is the alligator snapping turtle or macrochellus uh, timriki which is a very very large species of uh, chelonidae so these are big uh, species of chelonian they are native to freshwater habitats in the United States, usually found around their lower states, mm. and are one of the heaviest freshwater turtles in the world, uh, and the largest one in North America, definitely. Though they are often compared to the common snapping turtle, they are not closely related. And there's only one, the one species alive is the Macrochelles. Um, uh, there's believed to be one species, but often been split into two. They show that there could potentially be two species. The Swanini uh, snapping turtle and the Santa River turtle, um, and also the Apollosia snapping turtle has been proposed. So there could potentially be up to three species, but usually are just collected and uh, put as one. And um, they're found primarily in the southeastern United States and freshwater um, areas. This includes places like such as the Florida Panhandle, uh, west of East Texas, north of Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Tennessee. So they're kind of found in those lower states. And typically, only nesting females will venture onto land. They spend most of their time in the water. And um, you can see they kind of get the name the alligator snapper because they've got these really really distinctive plates here that almost look like an ankylosaur and that kind of gives them the name the alligator snapper they look sharp and pointy like the osteodium, osteoderms of an alligator and they look really really cool very very cool look and this actually helps not as much with protection but more with breaking their outline outline to help them look uh, 
to help, uh, have to help them hide better in the water and things like that. And um, they also have lots of radiating patterns such as yellow eyes and things uh, that helps break their outline and helps keep them camouflage. And also in their mouths here, I wonder if they show it in here, but they have... Since they're ambush predators, they will sit with their mouths open and not move pretty much forever. And they have a little uh, tongue with a little worm thing that helps attract fish. So they will open their mouths and then just eat it. Which I think is super, super interesting. And also these guys can get pretty big. The largest for a viable um, snapping turtle, I think, is about 183 kilograms or 403 pounds. Uh, though that is debated. Uh, although there have been some being weighed to about like 107 to 135 kilos or 236 to 298 pounds So about 200 250 pounds is probably a good range for these guys And these guys have a general carapace length of about 35 to 80 centimeters uh, Or 13 to 31 inches a way between 80.4 to 80 kilograms with males being typically a little larger than the females and they're really, really, really great little guys. So these guys, as I mentioned, they're opportunistic feeders. So they're, and they're almost entirely carnivorous. So they pretty much eat whatever they can get their mouths around. They'll eat all sorts of like mollusks, fish, amphibians, snakes, snails, invertebrates, other turtles as well. And even small alligators have been recorded eating. Uh, they'll also eat, when they get the chance, rodents such as muskrats and other small mammals such as raccoons, armadillos, mice, squirrels. Just basically anything they can get their mouths around. And they actually most likely hunt at night, though they may actually hunt diurnally as well, but mainly at night. And they use their um, little tongue, as I mentioned, in the murky water to help attract prey. And they also have, um, do not actively hunt their prey, but they have chemosensory, so they can detect like um, certain um, like uh, chemicals or like pheromones and things like that, hormones in the water, so they're able to detect uh, fish in that area, so they can kind of use it to catch food as well. And smaller fish, such as minnows, are also caught this way by younger alligator snapping turtles, and as they get, uh, but older alligators uh, snapping turtles need to eat a lot more to sustain their body mass. And in captivity, I'll eat beef, chicken, rabbit, whatever they can get their mouths around. So these guys, uh, in terms of their reproduction and lifespan, they reach about 12 years of age uh, maturity and their mating will take place yearly and the southern part of their range uh, is later than spring and then the northern part and at about two months later the female will lay a nest of about 10 to 50 eggs and the sex again is used uh, determined by the temperature so it's kind of uh, higher temperatures will produce more males and lower temperatures more females in the nest and they will incubate for about 100 to 140 days where the hatchling will emerge and early fall. And though we have no idea of their potential lifespan, it's believed that they could be capable of living up over 200 years, but 80 to 120 is more likely, and in captivity they typically live about uh, 20 to 70 years. But that could just be to bad husbandry as well. Um, alligator snapping turtle is most vulnerable predators uh, before and shortly after hatching, similar to like the other turtle species because they're shallow and quite developed properly and the eggs can also be eaten by birds and uh, other animals and small mammals and things like that and humans are also a threat to these guys and in terms of invasive species they have been released in uh, Czech Republic, Germany and Hungary uh, but they seem to have uh, kind of uh, since they've been kind of commonly kept as pets occasionally so often they can be found in these waterways but there have been strict laws to prevent them becoming an invasive species uh, in places where they're not native and um, in terms of their conservation status I believe they are considered uh, vulnerable because of the exotic pet trade as well and also hunting for their meat and habitat destruction there have been uh, bans on collecting these guys from the wild in a lot of places where they live where they're considered as a, a threatened species or vulnerable species and they're considered endangered in several states such as Indiana, Kentucky and Missouri and are protected but so they are kind of they're not on the road to recovery but they're doing okay it's just that they are very sensible to, uh not sensible uh, susceptible to these kind of factors so they need to be make sure they're taken care of so really really wonderful tortoises there and turtles there that was again done by leaf and our next one here is another kind of uh check back on the remaster we have got the eurasian uh moose so wonderful guys here we'll have a look at the male here and there's two girls really really wonderful little remake here so these guys in europe are called elk and that can be quite confusing because the waipati 
uh, in America is also called elk, so that's why they call them moose in America. It's kind of the same with like caribou and reindeer and um, the Americas and Europe, it's just different. But um, these guys typically are found in like boreal forests across like Eurasia, so kind of like places such as uh, Finland, like Scandinavia, Russia, uh, a lot of those more northern uh, Eurasian countries. But in, in America, obviously, the moose, which is the same thing, it's just a different subspecies, typically found around like Canada and Alaska and some of the higher um, uh, states, so it's like the Montana and things. So yeah, they're very confusing uh, naming. Uh, I believe these guys do not really get as big as uh, some of the largest uh, uh, subspecies or populations in America. These guys typically get about 1.4 to 2.1 meters or 4 foot 7 to 6 foot 11 high at the shoulder. And they're quite, quite a bit bigger than the Waipati or the elk. Um, and they generally weigh between 200 and 490 kilograms depending on the race or climb and also nutrition as well. Uh, these guys are also browsing herbivores but they will also eat a lot of aquatic plants. They're very very adept at diving and they'll eat about 32 kilos of food per day. Uh, so that's a lot of food they got to eat. So, um, kind of the differences uh, in North America and the habitat they typically live in, obviously, um, boreal forests, but they do enjoy swamps and things. And in Europe and Asia, they're currently found in large numbers across, like, North uh, Norway, Sweden, Poland, Belarus, and northern Ukraine. They're quite common in there. Uh, they used to be a little more common there was the Caucasus Mountains uh, population of moose, but they've gone extinct. And um, during the early 20th century, they kind of were hunted a lot by peoples, like hunters and stuff. There was a big um, effort in kind of like hunting a lot of these animals, sadly. Uh, it happened to also the wisent and other wolves and things. Big hunting there. And though they seem to be doing quite well around those areas, there's also populations in Russia and Mongolia, also northeastern China as well. And they're mostly stable around these areas, with the population being within like the few thousand animals. So they are doing quite well. I believe the population overall is like about a million. So they're doing quite well. And they have been, um, they actually have been moving into back into areas like with rewilding projects and things. They've been trying to bring them back to places like Germany where they used to live. So I think that's very, very interesting. And um, really cool animals. I'm a big fan of Eurasian moose. And um, these guys, as I mentioned, were done by Leaf and Nicholas Lionrider, uh, as common as the. Uh, duo is. Uh, I'm, I do like Nick and all of the mods he makes. He's kind of like one of the vanguard or one of the top tier modders that we've got here. And look at this wonderful baby. Very, very cute. Cool that he gave this one a revisit. I think that's awesome. And speaking of some more revisits, now we've got the common dolphin or the short beak common dolphin. So look at that over here. That was done by Leaf, Buffsu, and Arkia. So these guys. Uh, they're one of the most abundant cetaceans in the world, with a population of about 6 million, so they're considered least concerned. And um, they are kind of not thought to be the architect of Wolgolpin for some reason, but they're often... Uh, people think of the common dolphin and they think of a bottlenose dolphin, but these are what common dolphins actually look like. We'll have a look at you over here since you're swimming. Really, really wonderful guys over here. Though they have been kind of proposed as two different uh, uh, species, they're often considered often ecotypes as well. There's the short beak common dolphin and the long beak. These guys are the short, and they're medium size in terms of dolphins. They get about 1.9 to 2.5 meters, or six foot two to eight foot two, and weigh between 80 and 275, 235 kilograms, or 176 to 518 pounds. Although they generally stay around our 80 to 150 kilograms, or 100 uh, well, 80 to 150 kilograms or 180 to 330 pounds with males usually generally being a little bit heavier and you can see they've uh, got these quite interesting patterns to them are they all coming up to eat i want to see one swimming oh, we'll go over here then. so these guys uh, kind of have this really cool hourglass pattern with the yellow there and uh, generally they're white and dark they're quite counter shaded which helps them hide in the water column and um, yeah, they pretty much found all over the world. They're the shallow areas. They can be found from not the most extreme latitudes. They'd be found Australia, New Zealand, um, across like the northern uh, Pacific uh, coastal areas, also in like uh, uh, 
uh, around Africa and in the North Atlantic and uh, North Pacific as well. Really, really cool bunch of animals. Uh, that's where they're found. Um, they generally warm and uh, live in these kind of warm tropical waters. They're not typically found too far south, but they do like um, the kind of shallow, warm waters of like the tropics and the subtropics. So they're also very widely distributed as, as terms of that. So they're also quite found in these quite large groups. They're quite social, and they often associate with other dolphin species, such as pilot whales and um, rizzo dolphins and stuff like that and some have been even seen like playing with humpback whales and things like that and they also use signature whistles and stuff to communicate their dolphins have quite a complex social life um, they use complex whistles and even some people consider it kind of a language to communicate with each other which is really really cool and these guys also live in these large fusion fission societies so pods will join up and they'll go off and do their own thing and then they'll come back and that shows that there's a lot of genetic mixing as well they're not very reproductively isolated they're always changing pods and meeting new ones and having babies with different members of different pods that helps give their um, populations uh, nice and genetically varied and they have a just let's find the baby I know there's a baby in here there you are so the gestation period is about 10 to 11 months a little longer than the humans and the baby is born at about 70 to 100 centimeters or two foot three inches uh, or three foot three inches and weigh about 10 kilograms and in the black sea population weaning occurs at about five to six months but occurs later at about 19 months in other areas uh, typical inner birth periods are range from about a, a year to three years in different populations and age of sexual maturity kind of ranges between different populations but it's usually between two to seven in females and three to twelve in males and um, there's no evidence to seem to be the uh, hybridization uh, of these two kind of long beak and short beak uh, but they have been known in captivity to uh, hybridize with common bottlenose dolphins though the long beak and short beak uh, what are you doing on the ground uh, anyway have a look over here they seem to be uh, quite reproductively isolated from the long beak common dolphin so as the most uh, common cetacean in the world they're often considered least concern and the estimated population is over about like 6 million common dolphins around the world. Uh, though they do face a wide variety of threats uh, faced by other species as well, kind of like gill netting, uh, ocean pollution, plastic pollution, bycatch, a lot of those similar issues uh, they've been found to deal with. And um, also they can be quite commonly found in mass stranding events where a whole pod will kind of strand themselves, which is obviously very, very not good. And they're also one of them, uh, even though they're common in the wild, they're not the most common in captivity. They've been kept on a few different occasions though, uh, such as like SeaWorld, places like that. And they have been hybridized with about different um, uh, species as well in captivity, such as the bottlenose dolphin. And um, they actually, there was a study conducted in New Zealand that we react to swimmers in marine land, which I actually went there when I was a kid. It's been closed down for about a, over a decade now. Um, but they did some studies and it showed that they unlike bottlenose dolphins these guys were quite antagonistic uh, to people in the pools that when people were swimming in the pools they're generally not allowed to swim in them uh, but they're really really um, interesting dolphins and they also surface more frequently which is could be an indicator of stress and active and uh, playful behavior decreased when swimmers were present uh, and it's generally found consistent with wild common dolphins that avoid swimmers in the wild so yeah, a really really cool bunch of animals there and a nice remake. Cool to see these guys coming back and getting a touch up. So these were done by Leaf, Jen, Buffsu and Arkia. So make sure everyone's credited. And next we've got a uh, subspecies of Red Wolf, uh, not Red Wolf, uh, Red Fox. We've got the Kodiak Red Fox. So these guys, oh, bit of a splotchy pattern there, but it's okay. Uh, I believe it's just a bug. Uh, there's one of the babies here. Where's one of the other adult? There she is. Oh no, that's the yeah, other issue. There he is. Um, these guys, a the Kodiak red fox. They're obviously a subspecies of the red fox that can only be found on the Kodiak archipelago, uh, which is, uh, I believe, is in like Kodiak, which is off like coast of Alaska or British Columbia, somewhere around there. And they're one of only six mammals that are native to the archipelago, and they're not too different in looks. They mainly just look like a little bit more. Probably a little bit bigger because of Bergman's rule. Uh, big coarse tails. It's just an isolated population of um, foxes. 
the silver foxes can be found in these populations, but they're a little bit less common than other populations. It's just really, really cool. And these guys will tend to breed about February to March in Alaska. And soon after mating, the female will prepare a den and for the arrival of her kits, which are all very, very cute little guys, like this guy over here. Where's the other ones? Oh, these wonderful little cuties here. Little cute little foxes. And the litter are born after gestation about uh, 51 to 54 days. And an average litter consists of about four kits, but a larger litter can be up to ten kits. So that's very interesting. They open their eyes at about eight to ten days old, and they leave the den for the first time at five to six weeks old. And by the time they are three months old, they begin to hunt on their own and leave their mother when they're about seven months. And in the summer, you'll often see them kind of running around, chasing each other, playing in dens, things like that, learning how to be uh, little uh, foxes and survive, obviously. And luckily they are quite adaptable, so they are considered least concern. And these guys even thrive in urban areas where people are, and often people are obviously fascinated with them. And um, around the early 1900s, these, all these fox farms with supply pelts were established on a lot of these small islands across the Kodiak archipelago. So that's where they kind of uh, often hanged out and got all of their pelts from, but uh, that's pretty much dead now. Though you are, I believe you're legally allowed to hunt them. Really, really cool guys. Uh, often in the Kodiak, since there's not as much food on land, they will often be handing it, hanging out right next to the ocean and uh, around low tide. They'll feed on mussels, sea ocean worms, and animals in the intertidal areas since they're quite uh, flexible with their habitats. So I think it's really, really interesting. And I think they do quite well there. Uh, they have to avoid the bears and things like that, but... Kodiaks is a, apparently a really beautiful place, and I think that'd be a cool place to visit. And it's really cute to see all these baby foxes. Uh, and this was done by Leaf, another Leaf mod. Uh, Making another fox, another day another fox. So, we're moving on to our second to last mod. We have got the Ocelot, who is done by, by a bunch of people. Done by Gaboy, Genora Pizza, and Haruka. So, very, very interesting mod that we've got going here. Came out really, really well. Let's see, have a look at you. Really, really came out nice. So these guys are or Lepidus um, pedalus, or the Ocelot. As you can see, these guys are kind of like a medium-sized spotted wildcat. They get between 40 and 50 centimeters long, or 15 to 19 inches long. Uh, um, and then shoulders, uh, so that's how big they get. Or that's what you meant in the shoulders, not... Uh, that's the height. And they weigh between 8 and 15 kilograms. And was first described by Carl Linnaeus in 1758, but uh, was found in the southwestern United States, Mexico, Central South America, and the Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Margarita. And also, they prefer to live in areas with dense water cover and uh, water sources and things like that. Uh, where's the other one? We'll have a look at you. Uh, and she have a run while you're being weird. But uh, like other cats, they tend to be active during twilight or at night, and the ocelot, they tend to be social and territorial, so that means they will maintain a territory. Usually in cats, they'll be the male, maintain a large territory that'll encompass a bunch of females' territories, so they're able to go and mate. And um, they're quite effective at climbing, leaping, and swimming, so they're quite adept at that. And they prey on small terrestrial mammals, such as uh, possums, armadillos, uh, rabbits, uh, a lot of those small guys and both six, uh, spe uh, sexes become section mature at about two years old and breed throughout the year with uh, the peak mating season varying a lot depending on where they live and they stay with their mothers for up to about two years of their life where they leave to establish their own home ranges and luckily they are quite common so they consider the least concern but the IUCN obviously has lists of threats such as deforestation uh, habitat destruction hunting and traffic uh, accidents as well as bad for them and they often actually occasionally been kept as pets even though they're not as cute and cuddly as your uh, normal house cat they are still quite cute and um yeah they are as i mentioned they are medium size they get about a meter long quite big uh, 7 to 15 kilograms is kind of the range between males uh, yeah really really cool guys here uh, they're quite common in captivity they also establish uh species survival plans so lots of zoos will have them uh and kind of mix and match them oh, yeah. i believe the population in uh has been banned hunting of these guys has been banned in argentina uh and a lot of other places in southern countries and it's the us as well 
uh, though they have been uh, allowed, they've been actively involved in conservation, especially like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, trying to bring these numbers back. And it's estimated that their population is about stable at about 40,000 mature individuals, which is pretty big. Uh, though the op uh, ocel population of Argentina's subtropical regions is believed to be between 1,500 and 8,000 mature individuals. But um, they also seem to be, especially in Texas, uh, there's believed the populations only be to be about 50 to 80 individuals, which leads to obviously inbreeding because there's not as much genetic diversity. So there could be a provincial um, conservation plan to uh, reintroduce uh, uh, ocelots from other places to give the genetic diversity to the, the southwestern United States populations. So yeah, really, really cool animals. A big fan of the ocelot. I love how the skins came out because we all know that Gaboid. Gaboid makes some of the most beautiful mods. He makes the best skins. Really, really beautiful. And I think these guys just came out super well. Nice to see the ocelots. So last but most definitely not least, we've got a Nawala mod. Everyone loves Nawala. How can you not? Uh, we have got the sea otter. So really came out really well. Let's have a look at these little guys hanging out there. Uh, really, really chunky boys. They look bloody goofy, not gonna lie. So these guys are a marine mammal that is native to the coasts of uh, north and eastern parts of the North uh, Pacific Ocean. And adults, as you can see here, get between 14 and 45 kilograms, which makes them one of the heaviest weasels. And I believe their body length is about um, uh, 1 to 1 1.4 meters, or 3 to 4 foot long, and they can get quite big. Uh, in that regard males being slightly larger than the females and they're actually still as i mentioned one of the heaviest members of the mass of the family but they're among the smallest known marine mammals uh, well you've got to complete with compete with blue whales so it's kind of hard to do that but unlike most marine uh, mammals their insulation is primarily comes from their really really thick coat which is considered the densest in the animal kingdom and although they can walk on land, they kind of spend pretty much all their time on the water. They only really come onto land to give birth and rest. If that, they t they very much avoid coming onto land. And these guys often live in nearshore environments where they all dive to and find sea urchins, mollusks and crustaceans, and even some species of fish. Uh, and in foresting, uh, foraging and their eating habits is pretty, pretty noteworthy because they often use rocks and things to try and dislodge uh, animals from their shells such as like sea urchins that kind of sit on their back and um, use rocks and stuff to break open mollusks and things which makes them one of the few mammals and actually one of the few animals known to use tools and this helps uh, consider them a keystone species and these kelp forest ecosystems where these guys will control the sea urchin populations where the sea urchins will often eat a lot of the corals so when these guys were much more uh, endangered where they were very much hunted between like the 17th and 19th century they were very much uh, hunted for their pelts and that caused serious decline in their populations so that caused the kelp forest to become much more damaged because the sea urchin populations pretty much just rose but luckily they've uh, made a good recovery i believe the population is now estimated to be between 150,000 to 300,000 they were hunted extensively for their fur as i mentioned where the world population fell to under a couple thousand uh, but there was likely a big international ban and everyone's like you're not allowed to hunt them anymore and um, uh, Luckily, there's been lots of efforts since that time about the past 100 years or so where there's been introduction uh, introduction programs bans and Conservation efforts that have really helped them and they've actually occupied now about two-thirds of their former range now and They've been considered a really important success for a lot of their conservation uh, like a really really good success story to talk about how these species con went from like 2,000 to 300,000 so their populations have exploded which is very very good though there have been some uh, pop population declines around the Aleutian Islands in California uh, they are believed to have uh, kind of increased or increased to a point where they plateaued or depressed and um, they often locally they are cons still considered endangered species because of that recovery but there's a lot of factors that could affect them. Now we'll have a look at these little babies. Look at how cute these guys are. So that includes pollution and obviously hunting was a big thing for them. Uh, issues with the coral, um, not coral, the kelp forests. That's a big issue for them. And it's actually believed that these guys, uh, they're ex extinct, oh, they have local um, kind of uh, extinctions around these areas kind of contributed to the extinction of the stellar sea cow. 
Although I don't know if the timing is exactly right, but it really helps. <laughs> it doesn't really help explain it. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, they've made a great recovery and they've come right common now. There's very much a lot known about them and uh, they used to, they've actually helped a lot with um, like uh, sea urchins and things. They help control their populations. And they actually have been credited with contributing to the kelp harvesting industry because they often control the sea urchins and stuff like that. And also have become a quite a popular tourist attraction since people think, oh, these cute little sea otters and they become quite common tourist attractions and doing quite good actually. And um, they actually do well in captivity as well. They're found in over 40 public zoos and aquariums, including the Seattle Aquarium, who was the first one to kind of breed them in captivity, and they've been doing well. And being some of the one of the cuter animals, everyone loves cute otters, they've done quite well. And they're, I think, a really, really great ambassador, for, especially for aquariums and things, to talk about how animals can come back from the brink of extinction if we just put the right conservation efforts in place. And these guys have really just made a miraculous comeback. From only a uh, couple thousand to 300,000 is a really, really huge increase in just a little over 100 years. So these guys have done really, really well. We'll have a look at an adult before we go. Uh, Narwhala, uh, of course, did a wonderful job. I really like how he captured the really weird look. They look very different. They look almost like a seal rather than an otter, and I think they came out really well. So, yeah, I think this would be a great place to end the video. So I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye-bye.